one of the traditional principles of the teaching. Is that the one the mind gains concentration, it's able to see things as they are. Actually, the Pali term means seeing things as they have come to be. There's an interesting passage where the Buddha makes the distinction. There's bhava and there's bhuta. Bhava means states of being, becoming, the process of becoming, which is a combination of past karma plus our present karma. But then bhuta, b-h-u-t-a, means things as they've come to be. Essentially what it means is the, the raw material that comes in from the past before we've added our hype, added our salt and pepper and mustard and ketchup to make it what we want. And the trick is learning how to see things as they've come to be, before we've dressed them up. So we can move on to the next step, which is disenchantment. Because as long as all you see are the things that you've dressed up and put all your condiments on, you're going to want to eat them. But if you see the raw material before it's been dressed up, before it's been fixed up, you lose your taste for it. It's like that Far Side cartoon. A group of cows is out in the pasture, and one of them is, lifts up her head and spits out the grass. They say, wait a minute, this is grass. We've been eating grass. What's the same with us human beings? We've been eating form, feeling, perception, thought constructs, consciousness. This is a lot of what clinging means. It means feeding, taking our sustenance off of these things. But if you look at the raw materials and then you think of what kind of happiness you're trying to build out of them, you realize that you've set yourself up for a fall. The raw materials simply can't provide it. And one of the biggest issues of life, of course, is, is lust. You actually look at what's involved in the sexual act, and then it's pretty disgusting. And so people spend a lot of time dressing it up. This last week I heard a group of people complaining. When they heard about the whole idea of disenchantment and dispassion, so can't we still have sex? In other words, if I get to the point where I don't want it anymore, but can I still have it? This is the kind of thinking that comes from focusing entirely on how you can dress things up and taking pleasure in the dressing up without really looking at the raw materials that you're dressing up. If you look carefully at just what's there, without all the hype, without all the added, all the added condiments, you really lose your taste. And you know, it's very difficult for people to look at what's already there, because there's so much involved in the adding on. You look at dependent core arising. It's interesting to note that the Buddha doesn't start everything out with sensory contact. Sensory contact comes at least one-third of the way through all the factors. You've got all these other things that come on even before you've had your first contact at the senses. There are all these attitudes, these intentions, ways of paying attention. And that all the different forms of fabrication, these already color the way you're going to approach sensory contact. And these are the ones that make all the difference between whether it's going to cause stress and suffering or whether it's not. So normally we bring this huge parcel of attitudes to apply to the present moment. And a lot of the purpose of concentration is to learn how to pare that down. So at the very least, you know what you're bringing. I mean, look at fabrication. It's the bodily fabrication is breath. Verbal fabrication is directed thought and evaluation. Mental fabrication, feeling and perception. These are the basic elements the Buddha has us focus on as we concentrate. First, of course, we take them and we learn how to dress them up in a new way. 
In other words, bring the direct thought and the evaluation to the breath. So you create feelings of comfort. You use your perceptions in order to maintain that sense of comfort. So these elements of fabrication and intention that we normally bring out of ignorance, we're now bringing them with knowledge, with awareness. So at the very least we can be clear about what we're doing. It's only when we're clear about what we're doing that we can begin to pare away the unskillful things in what we're doing, the intentions that lie to us, the metal verbal verbalizations that lie to us. We begin to see right through them. Say, this is a lie. This is not the way things actually are. This is not how the way things work. And we begin dropping those things, dropping those things. You're looking at the nuts and bolts. You're looking at the processes that we bring to the present moment, that we bring to sensory contact. And as you look more directly at the processes, you begin to see how false and artificial they are. This is what helps in that yata puttayana dasana, the knowledge and visions of things as they've come to be. So you look at the raw materials. You realize you've been eating grass. And you thought it was something really special, but it's just grass, or even worse. And when you can let yourself look at that consistently enough, okay, that's when the knowledge leads to disenchantment. The word nibbida sometimes can be translated as disgust, and it's the kind of disgust that comes not because things in and of themselves are disgusting, but simply because we've been trying to feed on them. We haven't really been paying careful attention to what we've been feeding on. We begin to see that the things we've been drawing nourishment from really don't have the nourishment we thought they provided. As John Lee once said, it's like most of the, f the flavor comes from our own saliva, like a dog chewing on a bone. The only thing that the bone has has any flavor at all is a dog's own saliva. That's what we've been bringing to it. You see that it's a futile process. And that's what leads to dispassion. The reason why dispassion makes such a difference is we've been so involved in the activity of dressing things up and making them into something that they're not. When you get dispassion for it, you don't want to get involved in that make-up, make-believe, dressing-up kind of activity. And so your whole experience of What's actually going on really changes. You see things from a totally new light. It's not that you've been watching a TV show and you decide you don't like it, and so you turn it off. It's more like realize you've been in an interactive game, and you've been playing it really poorly, and the game itself doesn't have that much to offer anyhow. So you lose interest in the game, and the game stops. So the reason we're concentrating the mind here is to get more sensitive to what we're bringing into the present moment. Seeing all the hype that we add to the raw material that's there, and realizing no matter how, how great you are at hyping things, the raw material simply cannot provide what you're looking for, no matter how skillfully you try to make it into something that's lasting and reliable, the, the materials are ready to fall apart all the time, all the time. And for, fortunately, when you stop all the hype, and this is one of the reasons why we don't stop it, we're afraid that there would be nothing. Life would be pablum, it would be porridge without any condiments. That's what our fear is. This is why we are so loath to let go. But the Buddha's great discovery is when you stop dressing things up, you open up to something that doesn't require any dressing up at all. It's much better to begin with. That all this effort was getting in the way of the happiness that you actually wanted. And so things open up. 
dispassion leads to release. And it's a release that you can know. It's not like you're blanking out. If that's all it was. We just blank out totally. What would you know? But you can know it. You can know this freedom. It comes from taking all these processes apart. So this is why we meditate. This is why we bring the mind to concentration. Not so we can just hang out here and have a good time. And so you can see the processes of the mind. Now they try to create happiness out of raw materials that simply can't provide it. Or at least not in the really lasting, reliable way that we want. I mean, some of the raw materials, after all, what are you going to work with? How do you create a path unless you take those aggregates that you were using for one purpose and use them for another? Meditation is a different way of dressing up the present moment, using form, feeling, perception, thought constructs, consciousness as tools. You dress them in a different way. But in the process of dressing them in a different way, you get to see processing as it's happening. You come to realize that this kind of happiness that you create by following the path is much greater than what you had before. But ultimately, it has to take you to a point where you even let the path go. As John Lee said, that's where it gets really good. <laughs>